Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just give uh, everyone a few minutes to continue to join. Um, I see we've got people are signing up rapidly, so we'll just give it a minute or two, let a few more uh, people join in, and then um, I'll get us all started. Okay. So we will uh, take a minute here, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to leave just radio silent. So I guess everybody gets to to hear the treat of my voice for a few moments. And Sound good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you know what, this officially nine, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today, Adapting Your Business uh, to the Coronavirus and Beyond. Um, you know, at this point in our history, this is something that's obviously unique to everyone. I think every single email that gets sent out is talking about these uncertain times and how we're in this together. And all of that is true, but you know, there's also some very real adaptations that we all have to make going forward. Everyone knows someone who's been affected by the virus, either health-wise or business-wise. And today what we want to do is talk a little bit about the virus itself, how it's impacted people, precautions we can take, possible solutions in the future, the ways we can make our businesses safer and healthier, but also talk about how this affects business and how we can move beyond it. This isn't the first time in history that there have been challenges, pandemics, national crises. So today we're going to hear from Dr. Padone, who has environmental management services. We're going to hear from Vincent Cozzolino, my partner at the Accelerator. Um, we're going to talk with Nancy Proyas of the Citizens Foundation, Tom Delator of Galileo, and Alex Becky, who is uh, with Brown and Wine Rock. Um, the, if, I'm sorry, just everybody who's on, if you could just mute if you're not speaking right now, if you don't mind. I think there might be some feedback. The, um, so we'll, we'll talk about all these things today, and we're going to go forward with um, a little bit of context in terms of what happened historically before and how we can use this pandemic while it's a, obviously a crisis, but also as an opportunity for business revitalization and course correction going forward. Um, Casey, if you could move to the next slide, I'd appreciate that. The, uh, the, thank you. So, um, I'm Laurie Diasuso. I'm the CEO of the Orange County IDA, the Accelerator. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about who we are, who the IDA is, and, you know, what we're not, and then what we can do for your business. So, what the IDA is, is a public benefit corporation that's designed to attract and retain jobs and, and businesses within Orange County. We're not a governmental entity, but we are an economic development organization that focuses on making sure that the business environment is right for growth and for for a for attraction naturally. But what we aren't is a membership organization. We aren't a governmental entity. We are really here specifically. It's a board of seven volunteers who are are dedicated to making sure that the business decisions that are made in Orange County for incentive purposes are thoughtful and reasonable. The IDA has also started a <clears throat> excuse me, business accelerator that we've had for a number of years and our business accelerator focuses on small businesses. The IDA is really geared toward larger businesses, but the accelerator helps entrepreneurs get through the startup phases, move through their entrepreneurial phases and really help them scale up their businesses. Right now, our focus is on recovery. We are trying to make sure that we have enough resources available for the businesses of Orange County to help everybody move through the crisis and then ultimately, once it's behind us, be successful in, in business. And that might mean a lot of different things. It might mean revitalizing your business, changing your business, tweaking the way that the business works, and all of those things are, are items that we can help you out with. Today, we have with us our board member, Steve Brescia, who's also the legislative chairman for Orange County. And he would like to say a few words to talk a little bit about the IDA, the accelerator, the COVID crisis, and um, what we're going to do moving forward. So, 
Steve? I think you might be on mute. Yeah, somebody had to unmute me. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the IDA and Accelerators webinar today. As Lori mentioned, I'm Steve Brescia, Chairman of the Orange County Legislature and an IDA board member. I'm on the webinar, webinar excuse me, today to mostly listen to the information presented and to hear from you guys and ladies, the small business people in Orange County. The county is here to help and the IDA is here to help. We're all in this together and we're here for you. I can be reached at 845-629-4329 if you need to get a hold of me with questions. Thanks and I look forward to working with all of you. And I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank Lori Villasusu and Vinny Casolino and staff, as well as the IDA board for spending many hours putting this loan program together. To do it properly, it takes a lot more time than many people think, and they've done an outstanding job. And I'm also proud to say that the Orange County Legislature unanimously passed a resolution, uh, resolution asking the governor of the state of New York to expand uh, other monies from the IDAs throughout the state um, and where we can tap into for other loans. For small businesses. I come from small business myself and the private, private sector my whole life and I can sympathize with you and in large measure empathize with what you're going through today. Over 100 businesses have come to the IDA COVID response team for help. The number one, they've asked for help navigating through the SBA process, which is, has many hurdles. Number two request has been on the discussion to put business plans together to navigate through and how to reinvent their businesses. Number three, how to source locally for customers. And number four, ways to access other loans such as community capital, local banks, and the IDA. And I saw it in the news recently that the Sullivan County Partnership also offered loans to local businesses. And I would ask the Orange County Partnership consider doing the same. And also CDBG programs, I'm going to ask the county exec and the legislature to consider using some of the CDBG money, which is HUD money basically, to offer local small business loans to uh, businesses in Orange County. So once again, I thank you and I'll turn the program back over to Lori. Thank you so much, Steve. We've, thank you for the, uh, the recognition and thank you for everything you're doing as a legislator and as a board member. Um, to, to double down on what, what Steve just said. Oh, you know, Lori, the, Lori, can I say one yeah. more thing? I was, oh, I was missing in, in not announcing today that the application process for the OCFC Small Business Resilience Loan launches today and you can start the process by going to ocnyida.com to start the loan process. Thanks, Lori. Sorry about that. Oh, that's perfect. I'm glad you said that because that was exactly what I was going to say next. Yeah, so <laughs> like Steve said, you know, we've, uh, staff and the board have worked so hard on putting together a loan program through our sister organization, the Orange County Funding Corporation. That application process, like Steve mentioned, launches today. So after the webinar, you're welcome to go over to the Orange County IDA website, OCNY IDA, as Vinny said, or as uh, Steve said, which will have a, there's a COVID button on it. It'll take you right to a page with all of the resources, the loan program being one of them. So um, we're excited about that. And we're excited about the ways that we can help businesses in Orange County grow and thrive after this is behind us. So um, Casey, if you would please move to the next slide. I would like to uh, let everyone know now that I'm going to turn this over to Vincent Casolino, he's going to talk a little bit about um, the, the COVID uh, crisis. And uh, Vinny? Okay. I hope everybody can hear me. It's, so I'm just going to set this up by showing this one chart that came from the New York Times. And it, it gives you a perspective of what it is we're dealing with. And this, is, this uh, data came from before we had what, what is known as NPI or non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the non-pharmaceutical interventions are social distancing, wearing masks, disinfecting, washing your hands, things like that, right? So before that, at the very beginning, this is from a restaurant in China and the airflow associated with the restaurant. And if you take a look at A1 was the infected person, they were carrying the infection on January 24th. Then uh, through contact tracing, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later because it's gonna affect all of us in business, they, uh, they identified several other people who became infected and the dates they were infected. So you see how that one person had infected so many other people. And this is at the peak in the beginning of the, of, of the, of the virus spreading. So today we're at what's called 0.9 transmission rate, uh, meaning by putting social distancing in, wearing masks, disinfecting, washing our hands, 
for every person who gets infected, 0.9 people become infected from them. That's way down from when this process started, which is what this graph shows. Um, right now, the uh, the only way to really fight this thing is to hide from it, unfortunately. So for those of you who like to, uh, to uh, uh, equate this to a battle or a war, right now we're hiding from the enemy. Um, the, the real hand-to-hand -hand combat, though, is being done by those people who actually ca catch the virus. Because every time one of them survives, they kill that virus in their body. And so, you know, as your friends and my friends have gotten this COVID, anything we can do to help them, you know, whether it's walk the dog or uh, just make a phone call to them every day to encourage them to keep, to get better, anything we can do. Because right now, just like the healthcare workers who are supporting them, the people who actually have this in their body and beat it at the end, it's one for the good guys. So uh, that's where we are right now. And they're heroes to me too. So later, we'll talk in, the, in this program about therapies and vaccines and what's going to happen to us in business and how are we going to put people together again, you know, as we, as we get through this. And the, as we go through the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about other things in history that have, that have acted similar to this that we can learn from. And then uh, how do we how do we move forward? Okay. Great. Sorry. Thank you, Vinny. Yep. I uh, I'd like to then. I think that's a great segue into Dr. Pudone, who wants to, who will talk a little bit more about the coronavirus. It sounds funny to say we're going to get to know the coronavirus, the COVID virus, but you know we're all living with it now. So, uh, Marco, would you uh, like to take a take a step to the forefront? And it's your turn. So if you uh, go for it. Sorry. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marco Padone, and uh, I am uh, one of the owners of Environmental Management Solutions of New York. Uh, we're an environmental uh, testing and consulting firm specializing in health and safety. And I also happen to be a professor at Columbia University and at Drexel University, where I teach uh, environmental health and safety classes. And the environmental health and safety classes really have lined us up or at least my firm, very well to be able to handle the uh, impact of the coronavirus. And what I thought I would do is uh, talk about a few things that would help you as business owners do the same. And um, one place we can start is just to try to get a better understanding of what we're talking about with respect to a virus. And I believe everybody's seen enough on TV, heard enough on the, the news or the radio to, to know that, uh, you know, there's a coronavirus out there, it's new, and that it's impacting us, but what does that really mean? First of all, understand that viruses are everywhere. They are, in some instances, thought to be the precursors of uh, you know, cellular life. Um, if you think of how widespread they are, the numbers are mind-staggering. You take a billion times a billion times 10 trillion, that's how many viruses are on the planet right now they're everywhere. So then the next question becomes virus. Is it something that's alive or is it something that is dead? And the question is, it depends on what stage you're dealing with the virus. If the virus is floating around in the air outside of a human body, it's essentially inert. You think of it as inactive and dormant. But the moment that it gets inside the appropriate host, that virus ends and starts doing its job. So what is its job? It only has one job. It has to reproduce. And it does not have the tools to do that, so it relies on the host for reproduction. Inside the virus, or in the virus itself, you have two components. You've got the outside shell or capsid, which is what you've been seeing with all the crown and the little points sticking up. And then you've got the genetic material inside. Now, those little crown or points are almost like keys, and they will fit into components of the host cells such that they lock up. And now the virus is able to hack the genetic machinery of the host cell and produce copies of itself. It produces thousands and thousands and thousands of copies until the point at which it's time to release those copies out of the host cell. And some viruses do it by lysing the cell, which means they kill the cell, they cause it to explode and everything pops out. And others, 
do by a mechanism called budding. And the virus does it by budding. It basically steals and takes a little piece of the cell membrane and wraps it around itself almost like an and you they disguise the sneak past the cell wall. And in doing so, it is able to self taking some of that cell wall with it. That cell wall, in the case of the coronavirus, is lipid-based. In other words, it's made out of greases and oils. And that's one of the reasons why soaps and hand washing work so well to destroy it. So you now have this virus that has gotten out of its uh, host cell that is, needs to distribute to another host to reproduce. And it does that by um, way of transmission through the air. When a host sneezes, spits, coughs, uh, saliva touches its hands or anything else, the particle will move through the air and will eventually either impact another small particle in the air, sticking to it, such as dust, might impact another particle or might stick to something from static electricity. But the end result is that these particles that are transmitted will eventually end up everywhere. And everywhere is on the ceiling, on the floor, on surfaces, on porous materials, fabric, so forth and so on. And so what we need to do is in some form or fashion, control the viral loading. We wanna reduce the number of particles that are in the air or available to us biologically such that when we get into our body, our bodies can handle the small number of particles we inhale or ingest. If it's one or two or 10, you know, our body might be able to handle it pretty readily. If you get a thousand or 10,000, that's a different issue. Now, once it's in your body, depending on the virus and its affinity for a body component, that will determine how hard it is for it to uh, either infect us or not infect us. Some of the past respiratory viruses impacted the lower respiratory airway. So in order to get down there, it had to pass through your nose, down your throat, you know, into your lungs, way down in the bottom recess of the lungs. And to do that, it was a little bit more difficult than the coronavirus, which initially impacts the upper airways. So that's say on, on to how it, it impacts and, and in the end, um, you essentially end up a, a body that is soul, and that weakens and all the physical ailments that you would do to, and including death in some cases. So, from a uh, practical standpoint, we need to figure out how to eliminate or reduce the potential for viral particles to be in our environment. And there's several different ways that we can do that. And that gets to the next part of the presentation, which has to do with getting back to work and, and health and safety itself. Now, I'm gonna tell you what I did for my business and my employees. Uh oh, it sounds like we might have a, uh, a uh, an issue. Marco, I don't know if you're still talking, but we can't hear you. It sounds like the service might have dipped out right when it was getting really scary and really good. So we'll give Marco a moment, um, if you can hear us, to see if you can get back. But Vinny, did you want to add anything, comment on uh, what Marco said so far? Sorry, I was... Uh, hey, can you hear me again? Yeah, you're oh, back. Yeah, in. there you are. Okay, so let's go back for a second to the other, uh, to the previous slide, if we can. Okay, so I was saying health and safety. I'm going to communicate to my employees what I expect of them. I'm going to try to modify their behavior because that's what we're talking about now. We're going to change the way people have been doing stuff, and uh, essentially that means a, a much better practice of hygiene and a much better control of cleanliness in the workplace. So. As part of that, uh, I have a requirement that I have under OSHA, under Occupational health and, uh, health and Safety, I have an obligation or duty clause, general duty clause to give my employees a place that is free from hazards, recognizable hazards, at which point we understand that uh, COVID is a recognizable hazard. So under that obligation, which by the way, 
issues. Um, I have to start with something practical. So the practical thing is going to be engineering and work practice controls, things that I can do that I can take the control away from my employees so that I can take care of that aspect for them. And include. It includes thermal scans, medical surveillance, screening and testing, and reporting systems. And I can also redesign their workspaces to increase social distancing and so forth. Next slide, please. Now, um, the other thing I'm going to do is once I modify their behavior and put together a risk, uh, you know, written plan to, to address the situation, I'm going to work on improving sanitation, which means cleaning up much more. And as part of that, if I'm requiring my employees to clean and use chemicals that they would not have otherwise used, I need to advise them of those hazards. So I have an obligation to do hazard communication which means I take all the stuff that I'm using to clean and disinfect and determine whether it's hazardous or not. And if it has a hazard, I tell my employees, this stuff that you're putting on the table that kills virus, kills organisms, and if you put it on your body, will also impact you. It could be something that simple, but that needs to be done so you don't create other problems. The next thing is we've been told to put masks on our employees. That causes us to have to comply with a protection standard under OSHA which means we've got to give them eye and face protection, hand protection like gloves. If we start doing surveillance, there's issues with medical um, uh, access to records and so forth. So in the written plan, we deal with sanitation, we deal with per personal protective equipment. And if you're giving employees protective equipment, you have to show them how to maintain it. Those respirators are useless if they're not worn right. They're useless if they're broken and they're useless if they stay contaminated. So you have to have a plan for either swapping them out or cleaning them. And lastly, you have to be able to record what happens on site if anybody gets sick or what you're doing to, to uh, essentially put in practice these measures to control uh, virus in the workplace. And lastly, every now and then you're gonna have to go back and you're gonna have to check your metrics. Is it working or is it not working? And you do that through program management and evaluation. Sounds like a lot. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's based on your level of complexity. If you're a small business with two, three, five employees, maybe three or four or five pages of a documented plan with several set steps are all you need. If on the other hand, you're a business with 100 plus employees or 500, then it's much more complicated. And you may even have to go out and and select one person within your organization to handle this as a task until we get past this uh, pandemic. Thanks, Marco. Is there an, <laughs> I'm, I'm scared, but I'm at least I know now that there is something that we can do to, to help move forward. Um, Marco has the, Marco Padone, Dr. Padone has emergency management services, by the way, and we will have um, access. Did you want to share your contact information, Marco, at all to, uh, to businesses who might be interested in some services and for cleanup? Sorry about that question. Did, yeah, did you want to um, talk a little bit just about the kind of service that your business can offer or share your contact information? I'll take 15 seconds. One of the services we provide right. is a sanitizing service. We're able to go out and disinfect workplaces. We use a combination of ultraviolet disinfection, uh, chemical disinfection, and air filtration. And by doing that, we're essentially able to uh, clear a workplace prior to opening. And then we work with the business owners to essentially do the housekeeping and cleanup. And, and we can go beyond that to work with uh, businesses to craft these health and safety plans if need be. So if somebody needs that service, you can certainly get a hold of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure everybody knows that there are solutions out there because it does seem overwhelming sometimes. You know, there are so many, so many confusing parts to all of this. So I appreciate that, Marco. Um, so now we know, of course, that this isn't the first time that in history that this has happened. And, you know, we've had to contend with natural disasters before. And this isn't the first time, though, either that a natural disaster or some sort of disaster gave us an opportunity to make things better. So I'd like to turn it over to Nancy Proyek from the Citizens Foundation to talk a little bit about the historical implications um, and situations that have been affected, have affected us like this before. Nancy? Thanks, Lori. 
Uh, today we're going to talk briefly, we're going to look at two different instances in history where industry needed to adapt to a quickly changing environment. The truth is that the transition was very rough for both industries that we're going to look at with factors that were beyond their control, but both emerged from the crisis stronger than prior to them. The first case is the film industry and the influenza pandemic of 1918. That pandemic lasted for about a year, and it's estimated by the CDC that about 500 million people, or one third of the world's population, became infected with the virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with about 675,000 occurring in the United States. What made this virus so devastating isn't really well understood. There was no vaccine to protect against influenza infection and no antibiotics to treat secondary bacterial inf infections that were uh, associated with the influenza infections. So control efforts worldwide were limited to a lot of what we're doing today, which is non-pharmaceutical interventions such as isolation and quarantine and good personal hygiene, use of disinfectants and, and limitations of public gatherings, which were really applied unevenly like we're seeing today. The pandemic hit the film industry hard and very quickly. While the film industry had been around for about a century, films had become more popular really only in the early part of the 20th century. And with the new flu, the studios were shuttered. Theaters, which were mostly mom and pop small businesses, were closed for about six months and distributors had no place to sell their films. Once the pandemic was over or had slowed, unfortunately, most of the mom and pop theaters, which had been living really month to month, still couldn't afford to reopen. But fortunately, some strong leadership emerged and really created the modern film industry. A man named Adolf Zucker, a small film studio owner who eventually co-founded Paramount Pictures, had a vision that he might be able to make the industry work through top-down control, or what we often call today a vertical integration. He and his friends started building everything, distribution companies, studios, and theaters. Sorry, they started buying uh, everything. Again, distribution companies, studios, and theaters for pennies on the dollars. Uh, at, this, at the same time, there was a surge in innovation. Sound was introduced. Films were longer, using more reels, and studios started owning, and I, I have my fingers in quotations, uh, they started owning actors. So through this innovation and consolidation, by 1930, eight studios produced 95% of all films, and the golden era of film began. Since that time, of course, TV has become a threat, and then eventually through technology, making independent films and owning independent theaters became possible again. Now streaming is in its golden era. And actually on Monday, Crane's uh, New York business had uh, an article calling Netflix the golden egg of the coronavirus. Profits are increasing significantly and more people are watching Netflix than ever before. Another way innovation and technology are fueling a change in an industry. Then our next example is in the airline industry after September 11th. In the first year after 9-11, Traffic fell nearly 8%, and it took three years to return to just pre-September 11th numbers. That was a long time for the airline industry, which had, a huge, which had huge overhead costs, including thousands upon thousands of union employees to carry, new safety regulations, and a customer base that was truly afraid to fly. Again, innovation and necessity kicked in. To keep planes in the sky, Airlines burned through their cash reserves and borrowed heavily for a few years. They dropped their fares to unprofitable levels to lure passengers back, and it worked. But passengers now expect rock bottom prices as the norm. Airfares today are still more than 10% lower than they were on 9 11 when adjusted for inflation. Passenger travel surpassed 2001 numbers within a few years of the attack, and a lot a lot of, of new, innova new innovations came. Some make, those end, some, some make us, the end user, happy, some don't, but they saved the industry and helped it grow. First, airlines operate on thinner margins with fewer employees. More than a quarter of the industry's 620,000 full-time jobs before 9-11 were eliminated. Those that remain are less lucrative, 
The average pay for an, a pilot with 10 years of experience in the 2010s was $145,000, which was 13% down from uh, pre-9-11 numbers when adjusted for inflation. And we all know airlines added rows. In 2001, prior to 9-11, 72% of all seats on airplanes were filled. In 2011, 82% were filled, which is really, it's a 10% increase, and that happened mostly through uh, capacity increases. Smaller regional planes carry 25% of all passengers, which is twice the number in 2001. And fees for services, which we're all very aware of, uh, the fees for services that were once free brought in $8.1 billion in 2010, which was more than three times pre-2001 numbers. Without check baggage fees, many airlines would have to report losses each quarter. So airlines are profitable, profitable again, but the sentiment has changed. Um, I read something where a person said, if the airline does, does everything perfect, the trip is just bearable. And I think we can all attest to that. Although again, through innovation and cost saving techniques, the airline industry is once again, truly profitable. Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Nancy. That's, uh, you know, it's heartening to hear, of course, that there's, uh, that there are ways that we can sort of emerge from this in a better way than we maybe even entered into it. Um, taking a downturn or a tragedy and building from it, of course, has a name. Um, it's creative destruction. Let's talk a little bit about that, how businesses have been able to course correct after an unforeseen negative event. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Vincent Casolino. Okay, thank you, Lori. So, you know, I didn't, although I've read about, lived through some of this with 9-11, this concept of something showing up out of nowhere, whether a new idea like outsourcing to Asia or a virus or a 9-11 terrorist act creates something called the opportunity in business to, it's known in economic terms as creative destruction. And this is where um, we're in this period now where it forces new thinking because we all know that just opening our business the same way it was before, you know, before this crisis likely isn't going to work, given that we have all these other obstacles now to deal with. So this idea of creative destruction has happened before: the Depression, World War II, outsourcing to Asia when you know we lost so much manufacturing here. What what do our companies do? 9/11. Um, and now the coronavirus. So creative destruction is a process through which something new brings about the demise of whatever existed before. So this virus, which is new to us, in my lifetime, I didn't think we were gonna have a pandemic that would affect us in this way. So that, which came out of nowhere, creates, it was something new that brings about the demise of whatever existed before. What existed before it was our normal way of life. And now we have to be, have an abnormal way of life. The term is used in a variety of areas, including economics, corporate government, product development, technology, and marketing. So basically, old industries and firms or things we used to do, which will no, or which may no longer be profitable, we have to close that part down and en enable the resources we have to move into more productive processes. So that's the creativity part of this. So this presentation from here on out is all is now going to get a little more upbeat. The idea here is we know what we're dealing with, we know the businesses we're in, how do we accommodate? How do we move through this thing? Not just not just to be to, to make it through today, but to be prepared for the future. So how do we create new? So I want to mention that uh, I want to mention that we have uh, the Orange County IDA through its COVID response business response team have uh, worked with over 100 small, medium-sized companies in Orange County. And I want to tell you, the net of our consulting with those companies, the things companies asked us most to help them with was to help overcoming every obstacle associated with getting the grants and loans from the federal programs that came out. That doesn't mean just take them, just help the companies to fill out the applications, but it meant getting banks to agree to work with the, with the companies and then following up with the SBA and the banks to make sure money showed up in everybody's account. 
nothing perfect there and we're we're working on hard as hard as this as we can but we do have a number of companies that have successfully made it through the process that's the number one thing we've been working on the second thing though is one-on-one -on -one consulting with companies so as companies have called us up and said listen this is the situation this is the state of affairs for me uh given given this covid situation we take we look for an immediate fix if there is anything like the SBA loan program or whatever. And then next though, we start talking about how are we gonna reimagine your business coming out the other side of this? So for example, there's some literature that says two out of five companies in your specific industry cluster may not survive this. Not just because the the, the, the business world, the, the, the virus has brought your business down, but also people get tired. And some people will say, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to retire now. Uh, I, and maybe I wasn't planning to, but now I am. So imagine if two out of five companies in your sector are no longer going to be there. Well, there is opportunity that some of those customers or some of those clients would be up for grabs. So this is the time to start thinking about that. Where do you want to want to be? So I encourage you to call us and all of these uh, charts and contact information will be on our website, which Laurie will mention again later. Uh, should you want to get into these consulting engagements with us nothing the orange county idea does uh it costs you money everything is free the third thing so that's the second thing companies have asked us for one-on-one -on -one consulting specifically for their company what can we do to get through this and grow in the future the, and we've had some very creative ideas uh there from from both sides heartening number three advocate for local contracts so a lot of the companies have told us that you know demand is drying up for them and you know, is there any way Orange County, the surrounding counties in New York State could do more sourcing locally um, because that can help us. And obviously, you know, having customers helps business. So we've been advocating for that. Uh, you heard Steve Brush on the phone earlier. He's actually been uh, been very helpful in trying to take this case forward through Orange County, but we're also doing it through New York State and through some lobbyists. Later in the presentation, Alex Becky will be on the line, and we're trying to convince New York State and the county surrounding us that this is the time where you don't worry about pennies or dimes. So if you have to spend a little more, but you can keep local businesses open, it comes back to them in many different ways. So, and that's been the third biggest ask from the companies, the 100 companies or so that we've been working with. So first was get us through the federal loan and grant program. The second thing was help me figure out for my business what I have to do going forward. The third was advocating for local contracts. And then the last was access to any loans out there that, that you guys may not know of. So we announced today the Orange County Funding Corporation, this is a, a, a derivative of the Orange County IDA, has, has announced its $10,000 loan fund with a maximum of $500,000 that we have to offer. But also Community Capital, which is headquartered in, in Westchester, they have a loan program, again, $10,000 a piece, and there are several others, and a lot of local banks are getting into that, into the loan business in any, they're in the loan business, but they get smaller loans to help companies through this. So there's probably gonna be a lot of options for those companies who wanna take on a little more debt. So anyway, creative destruction, which we're now gonna give you some examples of Things that happen may not be a virus, but even a new invention that took a company, tilted it, and forced them to either think about, uh oh, I'm either out of business or I've got to think my business differently. So we're going to put our imagination cap on for a minute, and I'm going to turn it back to you, Lori. Well, that'll be very easy for me to just flip it back, back over to Mr. Delator from Galileo Technologies. He's going to he's going to give us examples of how just because something terrible has happened doesn't mean that you can't course correct. So Tom. Thank you, Laurie. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna tell you three business stories that I think uh, are very instructive. You're probably familiar with the typewriter and you might even know the origins of the QWERTY keyboard, which was designed, the arrangement of the keyboard is actually to slow down typists because in the days of mechanical typewriters, the arms would catch and so the, it, was, it was designed to make typing slower. But what you might not know is that the first US patent for the uh, typewriter was in 1814. And yet it wasn't until the mid 1870s that there was any widespread use of the typewriter. Why? Because people didn't trust typed letters. People only knew other people by their hand, 
by their penmanship, by their writing and the way they wrote numbers. Remember, there were no telephones, no photographs. You were corresponding with people in business and, and uh, acquaintances, and the only way you would know that you were receiving something from them was by no, being familiar with their handwriting. What was the breakthrough? The breakthrough was when somebody came up with the bright idea of I can type the letter and I can sign my signature at the bottom of the letter. Sounds like such a simple solution, but it took 60 years for someone to come up with it. And as far as the typewriter concerned, uh, the rest is history. The second is the wristwatch. It took a world war to make the wristwatch something that people used. Prior to World War I, men did not wear wristwatches. Men carried pocket watches. Wristwatches were considered feminine. The US Army decided that it needed soldiers to be able to know what time it was. The war had advanced to the point where they were gonna to be told, we're gonna to, you know, to start this battle at 9.10, and people needed to know what time it was in the field. And that was pretty impractical with a pocket watch. How do you reach into your pocket while you're carrying a gun and, and, and you're in a trench? And so the US Army issued wristwatches to every GI, every soldier. And after World War I, when they came home, a new industry was born. Um, and and I, interestingly, today, in some, many instances, the iPhone has begun to replace the wristwatch. The last story is the story of the matchbook. Matchbooks once were everywhere. In the 1950s and 1960s, uh, because of all the people who continued to smoke cigarettes, there were matches everywhere. You got them when you bought a pack of matches, but they also became a marketing device, an advertising thing. Companies put their name on the, on the matches, and when you went into restaurants, there were bowls of them in stores and bars, and wherever you went, it was a common marketing device. Um, there was a family business in southern New Jersey that had an enormous market share and was very, very successful in producing matchbooks. It was a great business until 1973. And almost overnight, the business crushed. Why? Gillette introduced the disposable Bic lighter. And smokers preferred it. It was more reliable, it was easier. And almost overnight, the market for matchbooks died. And the owners of this company knew somebody who knew somebody. They went down to Princeton, New Jersey, to a think tank down there. And they said to them, you know, you got to help us. We're, 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 we're dead. And the people from the think tank came in, looked at their manufacturing process. Okay, you take this heavy cardboard type of wood, you cut it into these little sliver fingers, you staple it into a... Uh, a little book and you dip the ends in sulfur and you have a striking on the other side of the matchbook and that's what you do and they looked at their manufacturing process and said well we just got to figure out other things that we can stick on the end of these little sticks of uh, cardboard and the first application was that they put uh, seeds they put uh, flower seeds and uh, vegetable seeds that people could use to plant uh, it became much more convenient than having seed packs. And since then, they've come up with numerous other um, applications for that identical uh, manufacturing process. And ironically, had the Bic lighter not gotten the matchbook business, then the decline in cigarette smoking would have. So I hope you enjoy those three stories. Thank you. Tom, that is so interesting. I mean, it's you know, I've obviously, full disclosure, surprise, I've heard these stories before, but it's still one of these things where, you know, when you hear it, especially in the context of this, and you apply it to what we're all living through right now, you know, it's really incredible to think about the ways that, you know, things we use every day, and how they've been affected by historical changes or business changes, and just the ways that people have been able to evolve. Um, so thank you so much, Tom. I'm going to turn it back over to Vincent to talk a little bit more about effects on businesses and how um, this creative destruction can sort of be an opportunity, uh, not just a tragedy. So, Vincent? Okay, so now we're going to get into the meat of uh, what is going to happen to us 
and our predictions and recommendations going forward. Now, there's a lot of industries that 200 or so on this call represent, and for each, it's going to be different. I encourage you, if you want our help more specifically, and th is to call call our office and let's do the one-on-one -on -one consulting stuff because every company is different. And also, uh, we uh, we handle all of our uh, conversations confidentially. So COVID and your business. First of all, whether we like it or not, more than ever before, the New York, New York State and the federal government are going to influence what we do. They're going to put demands on us. Some of them will make perfect sense. Most of them will be will make perfect sense from the standpoint, and I don't mean this in a critical way, but will make perfect sense from the standpoint of a bureaucrat that works for the government. So there'll be very little private sector thinking in what we're about to get from them. But we could predict already, we know what those things are gonna be. And, and a, a, a few minutes from now, I'll, I'll speak more specifically about how I believe we're going to have to um, uh, accommodate uh, from spreading the virus, uh, maybe even beyond what you already know, which is the social distancing, the mask, and, and the disinfecting. But it's, so it's important then to understand how they're going to help us or how they think they're going to help us and how it may hurt us even as we start to recover or change our business models to accommodate what we have. So after I'm done speaking, Alex Becky, who's a, an attorney from a lobbyist firm with New York State, will speak more specifically about what the government initiatives are and, and uh, how that could help or hurt us. There is a part of that might help us, which is a certification that says you're sort of COVID friendly, um, meaning that you've done everything possible to uh, avert uh, COVID disasters in your facility. The biggest issue we have, and for each of you to start thinking about this kind of as homework, is the demand that you've lost is that deferred, damaged, or destroyed. So deferred demand means you're going to get it anyway. So if I if I wanted to buy a car, if I want to buy a car right now, but I'm just not doing it right now because I have nowhere to go right now, but as soon as uh, I'm allowed to get back to work or uh, you, you know, life returns to a little more normal, I'm still going to buy that car. So it's bad for the car dealers that I'm not buying it today, but that demand is still there. It's deferred. It's still there. The other hand, there's a lot of demand that's been destroyed. And so, for example, if you have a gym uh, and, you know, and I was attending your gym, I'm not going to attend it five times more when, when we come out of this. And, you know, if I didn't pay you for the months that I didn't use your gym. I'm not going to go back and pay you for the months I didn't use the gym. That demand is destroyed. It's not coming back. So you have to consider running your business starting from there. And that means, means different decisions. And we can help you as we consult with you on that than if your demand is just deferred. And then there's demand damaged. Dem demand damaged is, um, uh, just as it sounds, basically it's, uh, it's, it's demand that's going to be less, it's still going to be there, but it's not going to be the same. So for example, <clears throat> right now, restaurants, the demand for food at restaurants is not completely destroyed. People are willing to, some people are willing to take home delivery. So as the restaurants started to focus on takeout instead of eat in, there's still some demand, but we both, we all know that um, that's not as good as people eating in the restaurant. So they're demand has been damaged. So damage deferred, damage, uh, demand deferred, demand damaged, or demand destroyed is a good exercise. And we, we do this with each company we talk to, to understand what you see, uh, how you see this crisis affecting your business and going to affect it. You know, we didn't mention this earlier, but you know, how long this lasts is also going to be a big factor in all of this. You realize that until we have a therapy or a vaccine, that this doesn't go away. So we could expect more of the same for a period of time. So that's the way we should think about demand. And then also your competitors, wherever they are, they're gonna go through the same thing. So whoever has a better idea on the other side of this, um, you know, the weaker companies will fail and the ones who wanna survive and go forward, you have to capitalize on their losses. So that's important to know. The new supply chain. So, you know, I was never a big fan of outsourcing. Uh, I've been in the manufacturing business for a long, long time. 
And, uh, you know, I, but I'm a big fan of statistics. And so now that we have all the data in about outsourcing, I think this was the final chapter. Hopefully now, all the people at Harvard Business School and everywhere else who thought this was a good idea, now that all the data is in, hopefully we realize that this was not the greatest idea. Why? Because the loss of a local supply chain has cost, literally cost people's lives, created sicknesses for people. We couldn't get PPE devices. We couldn't even get parts to make them, which is pretty pathetic for a country like ours, in my opinion. So hopefully now people will take this you, you know, we'll take the idea of local supply chains more seriously. I want to take a second now and I want to congratulate just the companies that had worked with the IDA and the accelerator to provide PPE devices locally, Orange Packaging, Mello, FPS, and Zeal, and uh, Marco's company, EMS of New York, and several others that uh, really came, tried, tried their best to help wherever possible to fill the gaps from everything from making face shields to face masks. But it, as we went through this crisis, we also learned that when the government asked us to make things like N95 masks as private sector people, we realized we just couldn't do that. First of all, we couldn't get the material, but secondly, we couldn't infringe on the patent owned by 3M. So every day when they said make masks, make masks, we just kept scratching our head. So part of what we have to do as a business community is advocate back to our elected officials, of which Steve Brescia has joined us today, there may be others, that, that you know, to help us, help us to get you guys to think in a way that is good for both parties, for both um, the government and both for the private sector. But the new supply chain hopefully will mean more local supply. So even as our local hospitals, and when I say local, I mean Rockland County, Orange County, Ulster County, Dutchess, et cetera, as they started to source things like masks and face shields from us, you know, when the world comes back to a little more normal and they can still get them uh, through their own sources, which might likely have been in China, by the way, or other places overseas, maybe it was worth it's worth spending 80 cents more per device to get them locally. By the way, we all know that 80 cents goes back to pay employee taxes. It's paid for gas, New York State gas taxes and all kinds of other things in New York. We really it's really never cheaper. To, to outsource anymore. I think the statistics are in on that. But but how do we capitalize on this idea that locally produced products are important? And for those of you who have gone out to the supermarkets and it's and seen what's happened to the shelves, um, it, a lot of that stuff is because that stuff comes from overseas. Now I happen to be Italian. I'm not against the Italians, but as you know, the Italian has the Italians have the same crisis we do. Italian imported tomato sauce is just not coming here. And uh, so when you look at the shelves, you know, you're going to see at Adams, for example, you're going to see six jars of tomato sauce. You better hurry up and get them because we just don't make a lot of tomato sauce in the United States anymore. So there's a lot of opportunity here now for companies to create local sources uh, and a new brand image associated with that. So let's take that as an opportunity. And again, we're happy to work with you company by company to go, go on this. So each cluster though is affected differently. So if you're in the tourism business, the hotel business, the restaurant business, retail shopping business, health club business, manufacturing business, whatever business you, you're in, given the COVID crisis and, and how you're gonna accommodate coming out, sorry, coming out the other side of this is gonna be different. And if we, uh, if this seminar series is worth worthwhile to you guys, we're gonna take that based on your input we will do special sessions coming up next, uh, like a week from now, and we'll start to focus on industry cluster by industry cluster and what experts are telling us, for example, about the hotel industry and what are creative ideas there uh, to get people back into hotels. Employees and employers. So it, without a doubt, if you want your people to come back to work, they're gonna have to feel safe. And so in order to make them feel safe, you're going to have to follow all of the procedures that Marco Padone talked about. And, and your employees are going to also need to be safe when they leave your building. So they're going to always have to wear masks. They're going to have to do the safe the, the social distancing, wash their hands, disinfecting, all that kind of stuff. And when you discover or they discover that they're ill, then they are going to have to be quarantined. And just so you know, the state of New York and the entire country perhaps, but certainly the state of New York, is gonna do this thing called contact tracing. 
and they're already talking about getting thousands of people to do this. So what's going to happen is somehow or another, when you test for the COVID virus and somebody is positive, immediately someone's going to contact them and they're going to find out everybody who surrounded that, those people. And then determinations are going to be made as to whether or not to quarantine those people. Likely they will. So imagine if you're in a manufacturing facility and you practiced all the right things, but one of your employees did become infected and now, uh, and it's known, and now the contact tracers are working with them. It could easily wipe out your entire production facility, right? So, uh, but maybe not. Maybe if you can make the case, as Marco is saying, keep good records and saying, look, we, you know, we had 30 people in our facility. We put them each 10, 10 per shift, three shifts a day, spread them over 20 feet apart. They're never in the same cafeteria. They're, you know, we don't even use the same bathrooms. You know, whatever it is, anything you could do, it goes to the safety of your employees, the, the confidence of your employees, and a better sustainable uh, outcome for you as an employer. So again, each of those, each of the way you may want to do things has to take that into account. You know, we have other issues because even if as, not if, as business opens again and we start doing more and more business, if schools don't open, we're going to have difficulty where our employees use schools as, you know, a daycare center. Now, if there's no school, you know, we're going to have to figure out how we accommodate that. Now, for those of you who can get your folks to work from home and do business, wonderful. But for those of you who have to have people on site, it's a very different situation and something we, we need to talk through. And again, you know, every everything is different by industry and by business. Everything is unique to business, especially to small business. And then, you know, so what we want you to start thinking about ideas to enhance your own business success in this environment. One of the one of the uh, the things I feel I know some of our team members have worked with some gym owners who have lost, you know, the ability to bring people into their gymnasiums to do workouts. And, you know, so what can you do about that, right? Obviously, you know, we just started doing things like telemedicine, which is a super great idea that's been around for at least three years. And it's only this crisis that has allowed us to finally use it because suddenly things like the HIPAA laws and all those kinds of stuff that were in the way, now we're okay to put them aside, but it's a wonderful thing. So you have senior people, like my parents are 90s, in their 90s, and, you know, they used to have to get up. My mom had, is uh, very ill. And um, she she has Parkinson's, and even for a urinary tract infection, we'd have to bring her to the doctor physically, sit in the waiting room, maybe catch a cold or flu from somebody else, and then bring her home. Now she does it all over the telephone, and it works great. I hope to God we don't revert back when this crisis is over. It's just a great idea. Physical training by teleconference for people who own a gym. That's maybe an idea that you could put forward. You may have to deliver some of your equipment and rent it to the people that used to be uh, people who would come to your gym. But maybe there are ways that you can do business, you know, uh, going forward that's different, reinventing your business. So ideas to enhance business success in this environment is the second homework assignment. Understand your demand, whether it's deferred, damaged, or destroyed, and then how do you want to do business in an environment like this that could last for, for a year? Hopefully it won't. Uh, hopefully it will, uh, Considering all the artificial intelligence, big computers we have, the best education system in the world, you would think it won't take 14 months for a virus, but you know we'll see. Okay, next chart. <clears throat> okay, so I talked already about creating a way for your employees and customers to feel safe. And I will tell you that people are frightened. Lori talked about uh, how she feels about some of these things earlier. earlier. But people also, most people do wanna work. So, you know, they're going to want to come out. They're going to, going to want to get to business in some way. We're going to have to make them feel as safe as possible. And that means things like, of course, wearing masks and being able to speak mask now because you're going to talk through your mask, right, and things like that, but making people comfortable with all those things we have to do. We also have to figure out how we're going to uh, – oh, so no congregating. So that's like a real important thing. This virus really only transmits in two ways. One of them is somebody sneezes on you and these particulates shoot out of your mouth and nose, and one of them catches you, and uh, somehow or another it enters your body, either through a break in the skin or 
you know, through your mucous membranes in your face, you touch your face, and there you go. The second way is the virus is on a hard surface. You happen to touch that hard surface with your hands because you weren't wearing your gloves. Note to you all, give your employees gloves, wear gloves, but you're not wearing gloves. You rub your eyes or your nose, your ears or whatever, and the virus is there. So you, so the more you could keep people apart, the in addition to everything else, the better off that's going to be. We also know that if you want people to feel more comfortable, stopping people with high temperature, or also known as a fever, from coming into the building is a great idea. We have one of our companies in Orange County that has a device. It's about uh, $750, and it's an automatic uh, uh, temperature sensor thermometer. It uh, You don't touch it. It's no touch. You simply walk in front of it, you nod your head in front of it, and it takes 1,024 uh, body temperature measurements. And quickly, in just a couple of seconds, tell, you get a red green indication. You're either good to go or not good to go. So if we can install those in our businesses, it would add, again, uh, some feeling of safety to both your employees who are coming into the building, clients that are coming into the building, and to you as an owner. And as Marco said earlier, and Alex probably will say later, the lawyer who's going to end this thing, the more you keep records of what you're doing to prevent injury, to prevent stuff from happening, the better off we're going to be should there be lawsuits or other things that could follow. So don't be ashamed to, don't be ashamed, don't be afraid to spread those employees out across. And, you know, there, there is no sin but taking a business that traditionally is one shift and has eight employees and creating a two shift operation out of it. I can tell you that if you're in the auto mechanic business, one of the pet peeves for me has always been, I have to work during the day and I work long hours. So I may not get out till seven, eight o'clock at night. Impossible for me to get my car serviced. Here's your chance to create a second shift car service and people may come. It's time to reinvent your business. So maybe you put four auto mechanics on first shift and four auto mechanics on second shift and now you're open till 11 o'clock at night and maybe you will get the same amount of business. Listen, what are you paying for? You're already paying for the building. You're already paying for the people. It doesn't necessarily cost you anymore. It's just a different way to do business. And you're spreading those employees out and there's less of a chance for them to get affected and all those things that go with it. This is the way you have to think about the way we have to do business now. You know, for years we thought this idea of open seating was a great idea. Now employees are probably gonna not as much wanna see their buddy uh, in the building and closed office space may become more popular. There's lots of ways to do that. You're gonna have to decide if that's something you need. Much more work from home. Where there Again, we have all kinds of tools now to help us. This is one thing I think that between telemedicine, between using things like Zoom, webinars, uh, conference calls, all that kind of stuff. If you have a business that can, can work from home, you know, just one of the recommendations we have that we instituted the IDA is a weekly status meeting that uh, goes for two hours and forces everybody really to talk about what they've done and keeps an accountability in place. Now, many of you can't do work from home because you're hands-on. You have a hotel, you have a restaurant, you have a manufacturing facility, we get that. But there may be jobs within those things that can be work from home. Every time you do a work from home, you limit the opportunity for someone getting sick. And that's what you wanna do. Online, so you know, this is one of our colleagues on the call, Tom Delator, is never an online shopper. But now, because he's been quarantined um, and he's had to get, you know, provisions, he started doing some shopping online. And uh, he didn't want to admit this, but he said, you know, this experience isn't really that bad. I don't know that I'll get out to do retail as much as I did before when this is all over. Okay, well, there's that's a sample of one, but you could bet that there are a lot of people who have been forced into this predicament now behaving differently. And if this goes on for another year, behaviors will be changed. So it's time for you to look at your business and say, is online something I need to do more of? Daycare and jobs. If schools don't open and employees have to put their kids somewhere to be taken care of in order to get back to work, and school was the way they put them into daycare, we have another problem to face. And I don't have the answer to that. I don't think anybody does yet. One of the answer might be, if it happens to be a family that has two parents, and one can work first shift and one can work second shift, and that's how the kids are gonna take care of. You need to talk to your employees, see what your options are. The, the you know There's so many people worried about getting their labor force back when this is over. The company that's gonna get their labor force back is not necessarily gonna be the one that pays the most money. It's gonna be the one that pays the most attention to the needs of the employees so that they see that you uh, 
that you care about what's going on and you're keeping them safe. Increase monitoring. So here's the other thing. So even if you do all of the thing, if you do a temperature thermometer on the way in, if you do a uh, um, uh, social distancing, you give them a mask, they're wearing gloves, you know, uh, no congregating, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's going to be testing there. And you're already hearing the state and the federal government talking about testing, testing, testing. We're going to have to figure out a model. And uh, we've asked Marco to help us with this, but to figure out a model whereby our companies in Orange County can accommodate the testing necessary. So, for example, it may be the kind of thing, let's assume we could do saliva testing where people are simply spitting into a, a test tube, let's just say. It could be the kind of thing where every Friday morning, you know, everybody at your facility uh, does their test, leaves them there. And there's like in the old days when the milkman would come, we would have the, uh, you know, some sort of a company like maybe a company like Marcos come in, pick up all of the test tubes, bring them back to, to their testing laboratory. And then Sunday night, we get the results of all this. Every employee gets called and you get called. Anybody who's uh, tests positive for the virus, they're quarantined, they don't come to work. And again, it's another level of prevention. So we have to figure all these things out. And, and we're working with the, the IDA and the accelerator, are working with New York State to understand what their thinking is. And we have helpers like Marco Padone and others that are in the industry, Alex, Becky, et cetera, that are so we can try to find a way to get ahead of this. Now, listen, if the, if the testing is done by the state and it can be done routinely that way and they're paying for it or the federal government, of course, that's the best way to go. But if it, if it somehow turns out to be a private sector deal, we're going to have to figure out how we get that funded and do it as efficiently as we can as we take ownership for it. But you could see testing does matter. So testing matters because it takes a person out of the population that otherwise can infect one other person, that, and that could be you or somebody you're working with, and the disease is difficult enough to overcome. It, we just don't want that. So we're going to need testing in some way. Social distancing remains, aggressive testing and screening I talked about. And then the two biggest items we can hope for is therapeutics and the vaccine. So therapeutics simply means we like thermoflu, you know, at least the doctors could prescribe something to make you not be miserable during this. I have to tell you, the state of affairs right now with this testing is not good either. My 300 pound friend, who is an uh, ex football player, a big guy, when it got the virus, he had to get tested for it. And they stuck a swab up his nose, as Marco would say, almost to his brain for 20 seconds. And he was not happy with that. Okay. So I don't know how many people voluntarily are going to want that done to them. So we do have to have different test protocols. Thank God people are thinking about spitting in test tubes and blood tests and all the rest of that stuff. But right now, the, the test with the best of efficacy happens to be that swab test. So hopefully there'll be new inventions and we're staying right on top of that because the minute we know it's there, we're going to want to get, get involved in that. But the therapeutic means that once you have the virus, it would be something to at least make your symptoms, make the virus go away quicker, help you fight it, and uh, you'd be less uncomfortable as you go through it. So that's like a Theraflu or you would take aspirin for a headache, something like that. But it's not a cure. It's simply a treatment. And then, of course, the vaccine. And once the vaccine comes out, you know, hopefully we can make it in this country and we can make enough of it so that we can get it to our people and, you know, we'll keep you guys informed as that goes on. Right now, the prediction is the vaccine is about 12 to 14 months away. I have no idea why it takes that long. I, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, with all the advanced artificial intelligence, big computing, smartest people in the world, all that kind of stuff, why it still takes exactly the same amount of time, I don't know. Hopefully they're kidding us and it'll be here in six months, but who knows. But right now we have to, that is the fix. Once the vaccine is out and people take it, the fix is in, and then we can do whatever we want with our businesses. So listen, I know there was a lot there and there's so much more to talk about. And I have incredible, uh, not incredible, we have a lot of notes and ideas that we as a team, the Orange County IDA COVID business response team have collected through uh, very smart, intelligent people from the federal government, New York state government, private sector, et cetera, that we would love to share with you business by business. If we, if you would like our help, call us. Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Vinny. That was a, uh, a lot of information, absolutely. But I think one thing that was of the most importance, I mean, there was a lot of important stuff, of course, but one of the most important things that we have to contend with now is getting back to work. And you touched on it a little bit um, during your, pre well, a lot of it, actually, during your part of the presentation. But I'd like um, to turn it over to Alex Becky of Brown & Wine Raw to talk a little bit about 
um, the healthy workplace and the potential uh, certification for a healthy workplace and the ways that that will um, impact businesses. So, Alex? Hi, Laurie. Thank you. Um, so, uh, healthy workplace and how, how do we get open and, and, and what, what are the next steps, I think, is, uh, 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 I think, on everybody's mind. And, how do we weed through the politics that we see uh, between the White House and the governors and, and, and really understand what it's going to take to get our businesses back up open and, and, and running again? And I think if we take a step back and, 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 and we just look at the guidance coming out of both CDC and in the state agencies, I, I, I think we can, we, we can kind of start mapping out the plan. Obviously, New York is still on pause um through through May 15th my personal opinion I believe that, that that will probably get pushed out a little bit more um you know probably looking at a June time frame uh to, to really get um open and cranking in terms of business opportunities um but we're starting to see the state make moves to gently and thoughtfully look to regions of the state to start to open. Obviously, there is there is 10 existing economic development zones. Um, the state is using those zones to start looking at local data um, and, and developing plans as to which, which, uh, which stores or actions can, 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 start, can start opening. Um, through that, they have started to their process of track and tracing, They've hired the Bloomberg organization. Actually, the Bloomberg organization has donated about $10 million to the, to the effort, um, and they're going to hire thousands of people to start doing that. Um, just recently, the state has started, um, without announcing it, um, just started rolling it out through the Wadsworth um, lab uh, antibody testing. They've tested roughly three to 4,000 people in the Capital District. Um, and all of this data is is being compiled as to how we open up the state in terms of their businesses. And as we as we start going through that, you're going to see CDC um, issuing guidance, which they've already done as to how, how you open. Um, and it's going to come through CDC and OSHA. Those guidances are what's gonna, I think, drive some of the policy at the local level in terms of the governor's office. So as you start thinking about opening up your businesses um, and, 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 getting, and getting things going, um, you're gonna have to start thinking about having, um, how do you promote, you know, as everyone has been talking about, um, hygiene practices, disinfecting, social distancing, you know, creating almost a, um, a, a preparedness response plan for your businesses. Um, I think that, that the government is going to be looking at those plans. Um, I think you're going to have certifications around that. I think you see it already in some of the delivery options for restaurants that they've, you know, they, they are posting, you know, in, in their restaurants that they've been COVID certified and, and, and COVID food handling tested. I think it's about encouraging the public to feel safe, that they can come back into your business um, and that you're doing the proper things to not infect them. I think it's also important during these times to think about how you can encourage your workers to come back, that you're, you're doing everything as a business owner and a business um, to, to, to ensure their protection. As Vinny talked about and, and, and Marco did, you know, how do you stagger shifts? How do you work from home? Do you have the proper protocols in place if someone does get sick that, you know, it's properly and quickly reported? How do you, how, how do you track and trace that um, to ensure that your business can stay afloat and can stay operational? All of those, I think, are going to start to come out. Um, I think you're going to see guidances on no, um, you know, how, how do you take away common areas, you know, everyone likes to do the, uh, you know, water cooler chats. Those may not be available in the short term. Uh, kitchens um, where people can congregate need to be um, properly um, 
uh, looked at in, in, as to whether or not so proper social distancing in the workplace can happen. Um, all of those rules, I think, are going to be needed to, to have some type of plan in place so that you can, you know, whether the state comes develops and, and, and comes out with their own COVID um, uh, certifications um, per region to get you to, to get you to open. Um, obviously, you know, the, the state has has developed an essential uh, worker uh, protocol. Uh, you can ask for a waiver for your specific business. Um, however, when they're looking at these waivers, they are looking at, do you have proper protocols in place? Do you have the ability to train your workforce to, um, to provide um, proper uh, uh, training for them to, so that they don't in infect themselves or others? Um, so I, I know that there's a lot going on right now between the Department of Health and Empire State Development that is running the uh, that, that is running these efforts um, to ensure that the preparedness and and, and response plans um, per region are are, are going to be a, a, attended to. Um, we've we've started to see some relaxation in the state um, as it relates to um, elective surgeries uh, by hospitals. The reason that is coming out first, but I also think um, the reason that it is uh, important to watch is that I think you see that the state is looking at um, ways that businesses can start opening based on the data. And, and that is things that you need to start thinking about in terms of your the business that you operate as well as the business, uh, as well as the community you're operating in. How to make how to open safely is going to be the um, way that we can ensure your workforce and the public are are, are protected. So um, that's where that's where we're at right now. Um, I'll turn it back over to Lori. Thank you, Alex. I think that uh, you know one more time we, we say this again that there's so much. Uh, before us in terms of the ways that we're going to be able to or the ways that we're going to have to correct our behavior or adjust our behavior to comply with these new standards and certainly to keep everybody healthy and safe. So I really appreciate your input. And then I'm sure also that, you know, of course, we have all of our resources, as Vinny mentioned, a number of times are available to the public for free from the IDA. So, you know, if anyone has questions, any further questions about anything that's been discussed today, we can certainly help you with that. Um, you can also ask questions if you haven't already on the webinar itself. Um, Casey, did we have any questions uh, to address at this moment? Uh, yeah, Lori, we actually have a few queued up if you'd like me to dive into them. That'd be great. All right, give me just one second. Excellent. And we have so it'll be just a few. We have till 10:30, so we'll take a, a few of them, and then um, hopefully we get to address everybody's issues all at once. But once anything that we don't answer, we will also follow up with. All right. And as of right now, the only question we have is just for a link to uh, Marco's business. Okay. We will absolutely do that. Um, we'll have that on, everything will be available on our site, this whole presentation, but we will definitely have links to everybody um, that's spoken today, but definitely to Marco's website. I, since we brought Marco up, I actually have a question uh, for Marco. You know, we had talked a lot about testing and, and how we need to behave going forward. Um, what would you suggest, Marco, in, in terms of how often employers or employees should be tested? Okay, can you hear me, Lauren? Yes, yeah, now I can. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I have not seen any specific guidance. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is that it, it has to be a balance of frequency and cost. Right now, there's still in no clear um, value or, or cost to the sampling. I've heard anywhere from uh, $80 to $150 per test. So obviously uh, that's a significant cost burden. We were looking at, at, at the very least, 
a weekly screening and we're trying to figure out what would make sense with respect to that screening. Do you test all the employees? Do you test part of the employees? Do you test the pool of employees? The general consensus right now is that you have to test everybody. And so what we're looking at in a way is a way to try to reduce the overall cost of the employer by essentially doing a pooled sampling. I'm working with a company out in uh, in Arizona that has uh, some testing equipment, sampling equipment that would, for example, allow us to test if you have four people in an accounting department, you test those the accounting department and those four people. And then if you get a positive within that group, you go back and you screen that. Um, an example of that would be that cost for four people could be four hundred. It could be a hundred dollars instead of four hundred dollars for four individual tests. Again, I don't know what the actual cost of the samples will be. That's still out, but hopefully in the next uh, few days uh, we'll we'll get a better understanding of that. Great. Yeah, I know that's one of the things that even internally we've talked about how we can uh, sort of at least have some preventative measures in place. Maybe it's. I think Vinny mentioned before, gauging the temperature of people as they enter a building to, to weed out any potential issues. So it's good to know that, you know, hopefully on the other side of this, there will be more resources. Um, I have another question, actually, and I think, Vinny, I would turn this one over to you. You mentioned something about, you mentioned a lot about the supply chain and how, um, you know, I think this is an incredible opportunity for those of us, you know, for any American to really consider where their products are coming from. As an accelerator, that's always something that we focused on. We've seen it happen in the fashion industry where people have reshored um, from China and back to America based on, you know, our accelerator clients. But we're also now thinking about ways that we can keep things sort of hyper local so you mentioned uh being supplier for the county or the state government um what would you how would you direct people to get in that supply chain how does a business become a supplier for a county or a state government a good question we get that question a lot so this is an opportunity for those of us who are not very political and don't really know how to leverage our elected uh our elected officials uh, it, whatever county you're in, obviously most of you are in Orange County on this call, you have local legislators. So um, your locally elected Orange County legislator would be the first call I would recommend. Um, you could explain to them, have them visit your business, talk to them about what you do, and that could be any business. I mean, uh, I've heard uh, the county executive in Orange County in a very good way talk about how uh, when they order food in for the county workers, even when they're paying out of their own pocket for this food, they try to pass it around various restaurants. So no, having them know who you are is, is a good way, right, obviously for them to do some business with you. But on a bigger scale, I would get a hold of your uh, local county legislator, have them come to your business, explain to them what you do, and let them advocate for you. Ask them to advocate for you. And then, of course, uh, phone calls to any of the counties locally that you think you could do business for. Call the county executive's office. Leave a message with the secretary. I'm sure somebody will call you back from the economic development groups. Talk about what it is you have to offer and then go from there. It gets a little harder when it gets to New York State. But I think once you go through the local legislators and the county executives, then uh, after that, it would be through your elected state officials. So that would be your local assembly people um, or your local state senators. And I think that's the way you would approach it. That's the best way. It's always hard in the beginning to get into a new uh, client base, especially to work with the government. But the good news is if you could if you could stand it and get to the other side, so it could be a pretty stable uh, customer for a long time. Thank you. And then I also I'll add to that, too, that we have um, as part of one of the services that the accelerator offers partnerships with the Procurement and Technical Assistance Center, where, you know, even for the federal government or for the state government, which as you mentioned, can be a little bit more um, challenging to get into that supply chain. We can help guide you through the process to become a, a vendor and to get involved in those bidding processes. So that's also something that we can help with if anyone on this webinar is interested in pursuing that. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to, I'd like to take this little time to say that again, you know, I thank for thank you to all of our participants. Thank you to Steve Brescia for joining us today. Thank you for Nancy, Tom, um, 
Marco, Alex, Vinny, all of you. It's been fantastic. And thank you to McAllister and Quinn for hosting for us. Um, we have, again, I just want to reiterate what Steve mentioned earlier in the call, which is that our loan program has launched today. It's gone live. This is our third webinar, but our, our loan program is brand new. As mentioned, you can go to the ocnyida.com website. Right in the middle of the page, there's a COVID button. You can click on that and that'll take you to our COVID resources page. There's a hyperlink there that takes you to the application process. So um, I know it seems like a few clicks, but it, the, 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 the main point is that you can get there and have the opportunity to apply for a $10,000 loan. There, no interest for the first six months and then um, two years after that. But uh, I will also tell you that our phone number is 845-234. 4192. You can call the IDA at any time with any questions from this webinar or any other questions that you might have. You know, no question is too big or too small, and we can help you with all of them. So feel free to call us to reach out if you need support, if you need guidance for the SBA, or if you have, um, you want to apply for any other funding, uh, whether it's to the state or federal government, we can help you with all of that. Um, we really appreciate everybody's time in being with us today, and we appreciate, again, everything that you're doing as business, uh, members of the business community in Orange County. We know this is challenging. I mean, it's not a surprise to anyone, but, you know, the time and, and dedication that you're showing just by being on this webinar to get resources, I think, is truly indicative of the incredible community that we have around us. So um, feel free to reach out. I thank you for all of your time, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody.